Hello, and welcome to Level Up Stronger. The world is continuously changing at a very rapid pace. How can we all gain the competitive edge in our industries and thrive in them? What if you knew without the shadow of a doubt that self-education and access to forward-thinking experts in your field could catapult you towards success faster than ever before? The spaces we inhabit can inspire us, protect us, define us, and connect us. So we all play a valuable role in shaping their future. We plan to take a deep dive into various industries and careers. What are the future of the industries? What are the barriers to entry? And learn from the very people who thrive in them. We will take you behind the scenes to the people, products, and processes that keep industries thriving. In this podcast, we look forward to inspire and empower everyone to take thoughtful, educated risks and apply what we've learned in our lives so we can all level up stronger. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with Roshan Abayagunawardena and Sharon Witanachni of IEI in Columbia, Maryland. Rashawn is vice president, leading their environmental division, and Sharon is an environmental engineer. The company provides a wide range of environmental and facilities management services, including drinking water, stormwater, and wastewater sampling. They were able to put this experience to a new use with the advent of COVID and the need to track the spread of the virus. They will share with us how their team was quickly able to adapt to perform COVID wastewater sampling and how this information is used to predict and minimize further spread. Thank you for joining us today. So I'd like to start off by asking you each to tell me a little bit about yourself, including your background and how you got into the environmental field. Sure. So I actually started with IEI in the environmental field in 2008 when I was still in college and I was looking for a job. I was in Kansas and there was an opportunity for a lead-based paint inspector to be hired covering the state of uh, Kansas and Missouri. So I got hired then with the ownership. I mean, IEI was a small company. I was probably in the first few class of staff that were uh, hired to work at IEI. So I got my roots there. I was finishing off my bachelor's degree in industrial engineering. So I sort of started there and, and then moved here to DC, out to Maryland, and then essentially grew with the company. So uh, my focus area since has been more geared towards industrial hygiene and uh, safety and environmental health and safety specifically for federal customers. So that's sort of where I have essentially grown with the, the business and I have the division that provides customers with those services. Chira? So my foray into environmental engineering is relatively new. I started as a chemical engineer for my undergrad and for graduate school, I decided to pursue an environmental engineering degree. And my original focus was on being a process engineer, but As many of us are aware, there's a much bigger need for a focus on the environment. And so that's where my true passion, um, I realized, was in. And so while doing environmental engineering master's degree, I was doing work with bioaerosols, in particular SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 research. And so once I graduated, I found out that IEI was also involved in COVID-19 research. And with my want and desire to be in the environment, environmental engineering field, I thought, you know, wow, this would be the perfect opportunity for me. And so I started working on this COVID-19 wastewater sampling project, and I've definitely immersed myself in it. And I'm very excited about it and excited to talk about it today. Excellent. That sounds like a perfect fit. And we look forward to hearing, hearing about that in further detail as we proceed. Can you all tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with COVID-19 tracking and why wastewater? Yeah, I think this started off right at the first few months of the pandemic. There was a study that was conducted, I I believe, in England by Oxford that identified that wastewater can be used as essentially a surveillance tool to identify the SARS-CoV-2 virus within essentially humans who are carrying it. And the critical component that they found was that individuals with the virus actually start I guess, extricating it into the wastewater stream, even before they have symptoms. So it would be essentially, I believe, roughly speaking, two to three days before the onset of symptoms, where you would actually get a positive PCR test or a antigen test, that you would actually be entering the COVID virus into into your wastewater stream. So that, I believe, gave birth to this field or started this field where it was essentially being used to identify and monitor for COVID-19 within communities and within facilities of concern. And it was also a much cheaper and a much less intrusive 
way of monitoring for the signal because by signal, what I mean is essentially the COVID-19 virus within wastewater because you did not have to go in person to each person within that community, knock on their doors and swab samples. You could just set up a monitoring location for the community within a common area and look for the signal. And if it, you actually see an increase in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, then you could go on to the next phase of doing testing and, and increasing awareness and so on. So that's really where it got started, I'd say. And and it was used as a tool in areas where you did not have mass testing. As you guys remember at the beginning of this uh, whole pandemic, testing was the biggest issue, especially in the U.S., because the, the testing kits were delayed and, and you really did not have a good way of tracking the extent of the of the transmission. So I believe this was a quick, easy, cheap method of implementing it. So you're essentially looking for COVID-19 markers in the wastewater in given areas throughout the city to see if there's an influx in the amount of people with COVID? Yes, that's the idea, that we are monitoring it from, I guess, designated or pre-planned locations where we know that either it may be due to it being a location that serves a, a disadvantaged population, or it could be a facility like an incarceration facility, which are locations that we do. It could be schools, for that matter, that you would track, and you would have a static population in that geographical area. And that's where we would set up and we would monitor the signal on a weekly basis. And if you see a increase, let's say, for example, the, the signal increased by three times or four times, you could set up your parameters to say, hey, if we see an, a signal increase by three times, we're going to set up XYZ controls and work with the local health department to implement those controls. So for the specific opportunities or contracts that we're working on, we have local customers here that we work with who have partnerships with health authorities to implement these controls and and implement the response action based on the increase in the signal. And in the same way, you can have reduction in the signal too. So that would alleviate possible community-related restrictions and support and transfer that support to another area that requires it so, or needs it. So it's a way of better tracking it, using it as a tool for surveillance and also trying to allocate the resources more effectively because we all know that that became the critical component of this pandemic is you had a lack of resources when it really got to that tipping point. And I think we're starting to see more communities doing this because I've seen this in the news and other places that they're tracking this through wastewater. So I assume they can also track the spread of some of these variants that way too and know where those resources need to be allocated, where you have hot spots, I would imagine, yeah. right? Some work on that, right, Sean? Yeah, so a big part of the project is actually kind of tracking, like you said, where those positivity rates are, county by county. And it's interesting because kind of before the Delta variant came about, we were seeing sort of lower trends in terms of positivity rates. And then all of a sudden, once the Delta variant, you know, kind of made its way around the world is one way to put it. You instantly saw some of the communities, and we'll talk about it later, some of the rural communities here even, that maybe didn't have as high of a vaccination rate. You saw a definite spike uh, in positivity rates, even in the last two, three weeks. And so you know, we use that information as well to, to definitely target uh, potential sampling locations. Because at the end of the day, we want to be able to uh, get the most out of this project. And in order to do that, we want to target those high positivity rate communities. Thank you, Sharon. And before we move into further detail on some of that analysis, could you just describe to our listeners how this sampling is performed, the sampling process? Yeah, definitely. It's quite an intense process because there's a lot of different moving parts, especially concerning safety and protocol. But in terms of the sampling, how the sampling is performed, we have a team of technicians and each of the technicians is assigned a certain amount of units or, or pumps. And these pumps are what we use to kind of install at these various manhole locations. And we do discrete sampling as well as a 24-hour composite sampling. So we have the choice. And these units, they came with that ability already. And all we have to do is essentially program it to say which type of sampling we want to do. Essentially, we have an operation schedule every day where we have different locations set out for each of the techs. And so the techs will go with these units and they'll um, you know, do an installation one day and then we'll wait 24 hours for the next day so that the pump has collected enough sample 
And so then they'll go to each of those locations the next day and, and kind of collect that sample. And there's a lot of safety related protocol that has to be followed with this kind of work. Uh, as you could imagine, we're dealing with confined spaces and the possibility for falling into the manhole. And so there's a lot of procedural things that need to be considered. But essentially, that's kind of the basic overall of how the sampling is done. And did you, I understand that you already did wastewater sampling prior. Did you need to adapt any of your existing equipment for this specific application for unique requirements of COVID sampling? So we did uh, wastewater sampling at essentially wastewater outfalls. And these were permit required sampling that we had to do at DOD facilities surrounding this area because the uh, MDE permit required them to track certain contaminants that were being discharged into the, into the Chesapeake Bay, as well as the surrounding watershed. So the equipment that we use right now is pretty much the same piece of equipment, but there was a huge, I guess it was more or less a learning curve that we had to go through because the amount of programming and the stress put on the unit is far less when it comes to those permit required sampling events because you're not collecting as many samples during the course of the 24-hour period. For example, when we do something here, I'll just say location X, we would collect maybe two or three samples within a 24 or a 48-hour period as opposed to, I think, with the COVID-19 project, I think we're doing every 15 minutes, yes, right? Please. So every 15 minutes, we're collecting a 100 milliliter sample, mm -hmm. right? So 96 total samples. Yeah. yeah. So the units are being used more frequently. The chance of the unit failing now increases exponentially because of battery issues, because of the different components within the system. So we had to really methodically improve our process of setting up the units as well as monitoring it and making sure that you have a high confidence that the unit is actually going to collect that sample within the 24-hour period. Because the last thing we want is the unit to be set up and come back and you don't have a sample because that's a waste of a 24-hour period for us. And especially in a pandemic environment, and if you're looking for an outbreak, that 24-hour period can make a huge impact down the road. So our processes have to evolve real fast, I'd say, rapidly because of the need to change the environment, change the number of samples being collected and so on. Okay. And that brings up an interesting point as well. So with that, the sampling process and kind of time critical information, you probably have a kind of a quick turnaround with the laboratory and providing that and getting that information into the hands of the people who need it and analyze that in order to make fairly quick decisions. Yeah, that's where it really got even more complicated, I'd say, with these projects, because typically with a permit sample, you have a holding period anywhere between eight hours to 48 hours, depending on the type of analysis you're doing. So for example, if you're doing analysis for a biological contaminant within the wastewater, you probably have a lower holding period because the virus or the bacteria may disintegrate in the, in the water, as opposed to a metal that can stay in the water for a longer time. However, with this situation, we had a very small window because now we are dealing with viruses as a pathogen of concern. So we have to keep it within ice and, and process the sample, consolidate it at our warehouse, and then take it to the lab within, I'd say, about three hours yeah. of sample collection, depending on where the sample is collected throughout the day. So it may range from three to four hours throughout the day or a little bit over that. It's an operational, there was a lot of complexity related to the operations because you had multiple samplers coming in, bringing in all these samples, and now we had to consolidate it and send it to a lab on the same day and, had, and have the lab analyzed for it within, I believe they do it within 24 hours mm -hmm. and send the results over to the customer so mm -hmm. that they can do the necessary steps beyond that. And uh, Rashawn mentioned kind of keeping the sample cold. So one of the things we actually had to adapt to these units was creating insulation or actually implementing and installing insulation in the unit itself to kind of keep the total sample temperature down over time. Because as the summer months started coming in, we, we had to adapt in that way because it wasn't as the months, previous months in the winter where the sample was going to be cold naturally in ambient conditions. 
So adapting, it seems to be a big part of what you all have done to incorporate this for your clients' needs. What did you do from a staffing standpoint? Like what additional training was required for staff? Did you have to add additional staff with a certain knowledge base to accomplish this task? Yeah, it's a good question because we've always, as a company, been in the mindset of training our staff and giving them the opportunity to take take these uh, challenges on when they come about. And I think the staff that are on this project have really stepped up with that mantra. And we have Dr. Malinda, who's leading the effort from a technical standpoint. We have Rukshan, who is from a project management pers- uh, perspective, managing this complex logistical challenge. And then we have the technicians who come from all different backgrounds. Some have done this previously in terms of wastewater sampling. Some have not. Some come from a more technical, or not a technical, but a technician laborer standpoint, because it's not easy work. I mean, in the summer months, you're outside in Tyvek suits where the the temperature can get uh, above 100 and, and you're working with the instrument where you have to actually lower it into a manhole and it's strenuous work. So the staff had to be trained on, on how to operate the equipment as well as how to do work safely in this environment because you could be in 100 degree weather, you could be in wet conditions, we've done work in snow conditions. So the work goes on in most cases unless there's a safety issue. So the staff had to be trained, they, were, they had to be provided safety training they were provided PPE because we're handling wastewater, not just the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but there's other pathogens of concern with the wastewater that's there. So, you know, they had to wear PPE. They had to be given training on how to use PPE, how to dispose of it, how to handle the, the, the sample safely. Now we have the samples coming into our warehouse. So the warehouse staff who are supporting it has to be given the same training. We actually, I, I believe we still pasteurize the sample, right? Yeah. So there was a few more steps that were added to the to the staff who typically don't do environmental work that had to be involved and had to be trained to support the project. Definitely first aid training, of course, as well for all the technicians, because, yeah, out in the field, it's definitely a different story than yeah. what's in the warehouse. Yeah. And you mentioned something about the accommodations made for increasing temperatures, but I, I believe you started this sampling in December, is that correct? Or in the winter? What other role do environmental factors play through this seasonal, you know, you're not quite through a full year cycle yet. Are there other environmental factors that are playing a role? And as you go into fall and coming up on that complete cycle? Yeah, I think temperature is definitely one of the biggest uh, for us, because these viral samples, they just need to be preserved as, as much as, as possible so that the lab can, you know, properly process them and, and test and do the PCR analysis. So in terms of what factors in the environment are affecting our project as the months go on, I think that's the first one that definitely comes to my mind. I think in terms of the execution of sampling, I think Rashawn mentioned it too, safety and kind of like understanding the risks of heat stress and those types of things were also really important to communicate to the technician team as the summer started coming on because it is a real issue. And I've been out in the field as well with these guys and it's, it can get very, very hot very quickly and they're lifting and, and doing a lot of laborious tasks. So I think from my point of view, that was one of the biggest roles in terms of the environment playing a role in our project. What have you had to adapt to over the life of doing this? So now you're in, what, 10 months almost of having done this. What would you say has been your biggest learning lesson and what have you had to adapt your processes in? I think, so there's multiple areas, but I think the top ones would be the people. I think we've had to have staff changes just because they get assigned to the project and they may have other activities going on. So we needed to have a a bench, essentially, of people that are capable of doing this work are trained, also given refresher trainings to them on to get them back into the workforce when, when they've taken a break. And then also the project started with a focus area on the metropolitan areas to begin with. However, as the pandemic sort of shifted towards certain different counties within Maryland, specifically counties with low vaccination rates, we've had to change our approach and and the sampling locations, thus having to change the people because we don't want people to drive two hours one way to get to a sampling location every day. 
because that creates another challenge with time as well as safety because they are now on the road. So we've had to adapt and change and change our process and our project plan to accommodate all these changes that have happened throughout the life cycle of the contract as well as the pandemic, obviously, because of the shifting nature of how we're being impacted by it. From an equipment perspective, what do you think? Is there yeah, anything else that- yeah, equipment definitely. I mean, I mentioned it earlier, we definitely had to consider implementing some insulation into the units. Just a lot of various kind of additions and, and manipulation of the units. Certain things like the collection jar, it wasn't transparent originally. And so we made we replaced the original sample collection jars with transparent jars because we we decided kind of halfway through the project that we wanted to start tracking the actual sample collection volume in terms of milliliters. And so, you know, we had all the technicians kind of demarcate each of the sample bottles so that when we were analyzing the sample collection that day, we were able to kind of see what the turbidity of the sample was and the amount of volume collected. And so we even messed around with the size of the strainer being used to collect a sample. We were experimenting with two different types to kind of see, okay, are we going to be able to collect more suspended solids with this type of strainer versus that? So I think those are kinds of the adaptations that we made in terms of the equipment that we use. Thank you. And we were speaking earlier about the I, that you were able to identify outbreaks in multiple communities. And I was, I'd like to get back a little more into what that triggers at a local level and that process of correlating with what's actually being observed in the community. Yeah, I think it really depends on the community. Sometimes it's done voluntary. Sometimes it may be based on a contractual obligation where we are sampling at, at incarceration facilities, or it may be, and we're currently doing it downstream at wastewater treatment plants now, where we're actually looking at a larger area or a community or multiple communities as, as one. So the response action is based on that. If a community is voluntarily participating in it, then you would have that community representative as well as the corresponding health department that's responsible for that community participate in improving communication improving testing opportunities within that community because certain cities and certain local communities had uh, mobile testing facilities deployed within these areas. And obviously, the access to vaccinations and and communicating about the vaccination as, as a potential solution to the outbreak. So those are some of the actions that were used by our customers to essentially respond to an outbreak as well as if it was an incarceration facility or, or something where it's more or less a controlled environment, I think they have the option of putting on restrictions. This tool has been used by a lot of universities throughout the country, and I believe they have had the option of actually having their students either quarantine within dorms or, or within uh, certain segments of the school to prevent further transmission of the virus. So that's sort of how they use this as a tool because you can't really identify a specific person per se, but you're identifying a a larger community and you're using communication and all these other tools as a tactic to combat the virus. I think the impact of this kind of work is somewhat understated at times. I think I personally sometimes forget how important this kind of work is. And I'm proud that we're actually involved in this kind of work because like Rashawn mentioned, you know, we can provide real data to help kind of stave off pandemic related events in certain communities. And I think this type of tool is definitely going to be important in the future as well with regards to other types of breakouts or outbreaks, uh, viral outbreaks. So yeah, I think this type of work can be adapted as well to meet other requirements in the future. So speaking of that data that is generated Is that data finding its way back into the hands of researchers as well? I'm just kind of thinking on a broader level. Are you aware if that gets fed into a larger network or back to research institutions? Yeah, I think the data is published with certain restrictions, obviously, without divulging the locations that they're collecting. I believe our our customer has a uh, public site that publishes the, the data which you can go and check. And I believe there's another entity that tracks wastewater monitoring of the SARS-CoV-2 virus nationwide. 
I don't believe our customer participates in that program, but there are other entities throughout the US that participate in that program and they have what you call a, a dashboard of the whole country presenting, hey, this is what we have found. And I think in most cases, they've been able to correlate that data with the wastewater to what they see in terms of community transmission and in terms of positivity rates. And in certain cases, vaccination rates as well, because all that data is now publicly available for researchers and public health officials and public health professionals to analyze. And I think the importance, I think, of this type of testing is that only a percentage of the people who actually have the virus actually have any symptoms, right? So by tracking wastewater, then we're seeing it potentially, if you don't have any symptoms, it would still be shedding out of your body through wastewater. So you get a more accurate view of the percentage or the frequency of an outbreak in a, in a given geographic area. Right now, you guys are doing mostly urban locations, right? A lot of the major outbreaks that are happening are more in rural locations. Are you going to start sampling in more rural locations or what's the, the future projection of what you're going to be doing from a sampling standpoint? Yeah, I think especially concerning like vaccination rates, I think some of the locations we had initially been sampling in, we, we, we weren't getting much signal at all. And one of the theories we had was, okay, hey, given that, like you mentioned, a lot of the outbreaks were pointing to the more rural areas, we made that decision to, to say, hey, okay, this is, we're going to kind of move some of our resources from those more vaccinated areas to, to some of those areas where we believe we're going to get a higher signal. So actually that process of kind of transitioning some of those resources to those areas was definitely a tough process, right? Because that's a lot of manpower that you have to kind of move over and the whole process of getting the sample and then sending the sample to a lab had to kind of be restructured and reconsidered. I think that that was a big change in our project was kind of shifting our focus to rural areas and not just rural areas, but some of the wastewater treatment plants in those areas. Because we believed if we sampled downstream from those areas, it would definitely be representative of, of kind of those those communities. Because, you know, for instance, one wastewater treatment plant will have serviced about five to 6,000 homes. So that could give us a, a good sense of what the situation is regarding the, the COVID-19 in that so area. So is the client dictating where you're putting them or are we giving them recommendations on where have we done our research to figure out geographically where we believe that they should be Located. Yeah, it's partly what uh, John has done, actually. He's, I think he started uh, about a month ago, right, in terms of going through yeah. the vaccination rates in, in all of the counties in Maryland and identifying, the, I guess, the bottom half of that list and, and then identifying wastewater treatment plans within those counties and then give that information to the client saying, hey, these are locations that we would like to sample. Mm -hmm. And then the client goes to their own uh, resources and gets the necessary uh, permits and the approvals to sample on these locations. So focus has shifted more towards, I think, the western half of Maryland and the eastern half of Maryland now than I'd say the beginning of our, of our contract. We're probably taking... I'd say 50% of our samples from outside of the metropolitan areas right now. So the shift has been significant. The shift has also impacted us operationally because now we're having to rely on couriers and rely on FedEx shipments to get our samples here. So that does create a delay. And we're trying to overcome those issues at the moment where we send samples overnight and or <clears throat> try to have couriers from certain locations bring samples on the same day. So those are some of the some of the tactics that we have used to still be in compliance with the objectives of the program. Sharon, from everything you have observed so far through your research and analysis and the sampling that you've done and locations, and we touched briefly on the Delta variant, can you kind of speak to us as far as where we are now and kind of that next step into the future of reacting to Delta or potential other variants and how that might affect analysis or sample location? Yeah, I think as, as a whole, I, this project has come such a long way. I, we talked a lot about the adaptations we had to make. And I think we've come a long way in terms of understanding the best methods to sample, the best methods to get a, a better sample or how to collect more volume, for instance. And so I think over time, we've been able to 
manipulate how we take these samples in terms of like, okay, we want to increase our sample volume, we're going to do this and this. And so I think we're better prepared in that sense. And then going forward, we're looking at various types of things to improve our project. And one of those things is to kind of use another type of virus that we want to use as kind of like a calibration tool. And this virus is called PMMOV. And essentially, it's one of the most commonly found RNA viruses. And it's in all of us. And so as you can imagine, it's also highly current in wastewater. And so this virus can actually be used to calibrate our data in the sense of like, each manhole has different characteristics, flow, temperature, pH, et cetera. And so we're going to start using this virus to kind of calibrate the data that we're getting to see if we're getting higher signal, lower signal, are there any other factors at play? And so as we go moving forward, if our task is to kind of identify other viruses or other viral loads, for instance, enterovirus or, or what have you, we can already confidently say we have some of that sampling infrastructure ready to go if we're called upon. And things like using that reference virus will kind of give us more ammunition with regards to creating more valid data and being more confident in the data that we're providing. So Level Up Stronger is really about sharing information and providing listeners with access to new opportunities. So if someone were interested in performing this type of work or someone was interested in getting into this field, what background and preparation would you all recommend for future technicians? Come with an open mind, (laughs) because I think it's not the most uh, glamorous glamorous, uh, (laughs) job. (laughs) However, it's very rewarding. I think we have one gentleman that that works in the program who's who's done a lot of community work in in, in his past, and he's, he's really passionate about the project. And he enjoys going into the neighborhoods and seeing some of these disadvantaged communities and, and knowing that he's actually making an impact for them. So I think coming to the program with an open mind is, is very important. We've sort of, I guess, developed a process for getting people up to speed and getting them the necessary training to, to do the work. But it's always about having the right mindset and coming in with that right attitude. I think that takes you half the way. And then we, we can take you from there to getting you the skill set that's needed. And I think a big part of the job is actually being able to kind of think on your feet, especially with this kind of work. Not every location is going to be the exact same. And a lot of the times I've noticed as well, technicians, they kind of have to adapt to, I've used that word a lot, adapt, but that's like a big key word with this project because it's, it's a lot of adapting and coming with kind of an open mind and also kind of being able to think on your feet and and come up with solutions when things happen right away. Are you able to communicate that well to your team and your higher ups? And are you a team player? You know, because at the end of the day, this is a big team project and we need everyone on our side and to be on the same level of understanding and trust. It's out of curiosity, when you guys show up in the neighborhood and you're you arrive in Tyvek suits and you're digging around in the manhole, do, do the neighbors look at you like you're crazy? I mean, do absolutely. You, any oh, yeah. awkward interactions with the community? Uh, yeah, we. I know like a, a few of kind of like elder people. They've definitely given us that side eye, like, "What are you doing?" You know, in my neighborhood, like I've never seen you before. And we have all this like equipment. For all we know, they could think we're like spying on them or putting cameras or. We actually also have some kids that come up to us occasionally and they're, they're always curious and they want to know like what we're doing. And I like kind of explaining to them a little bit about the science because some of them are actually really interested in kind of understanding. And yeah, so. And, and at the beginning of this, these projects, we partnered with the customers, the end customers to actually do a, a campaign to create awareness of what we were doing. And and we were a a huge component of of that whole campaign because we provided them with material, with information on what the equipment looked like and what we were doing, how long the sampling takes and so on. So communication was was a huge component to this project and, and the successful implementation because you want the community to do accept us and understand that we're actually doing this for the community. Otherwise, it just clashes with the objectives. I think the objectives are important because, as you mentioned, the environmental sciences and some of the things that we do from environmental abatement to testing, it's not glamorous, right? And so having the ability to then, I mean, the, the real point of all of this is to make an impact on the communities and the buildings and everything that we work in to improve the overall health and welfare of the people who are living in those given areas or interacting with that given facility. 
is much of what we do. So rewarding in that in that regard. Absolutely. I think a lot of the staff who are doing this job really sees that uh, up front, especially when they go into these communities and neighborhoods, because I think the work that we're doing is really impacting and, and making a difference in, in those communities. So if somebody were interested in finding out more about the COVID wastewater sampling and these developments and how it's being used to track COVID, do you have any good references for them to to kind of follow and track and find out more? Yeah, I think the CDC offers some uh, information. That's really where we went as a company to our understanding of this whole process and what you should do and what you should not be doing. But more from a high level, I believe there's resources that are available within different universities and different housing uh, authorities that are participating in these programs. I think that's really the knowledge base. I believe there's a, an organization called the Wastewater Symposium that I have been involved in that we actually shared our project in. That actually, that organization has a collection of people and universities and organizations that have actually done this wastewater monitoring in not just in the U.S., but in Africa, in Asia, all throughout the world. So the tool is not just uh, used here in the Americas it's, and in Europe. It's been used in countries like Africa, where you may not have a complex wastewater distribution or wastewater system. They're actually doing that at a, at a community level where they're going in and collecting the samples from the actual community itself. So there's a lot of information out there, and there's a lot of activities happening in this field that you can access. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of Level Up Stronger, and thank you to you and your entire team for the work you're doing to help better understand and predict the spread of this virus. We really appreciate your dedication and taking the time to share your experience with us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Level Up Stronger. For references to resources mentioned in this episode and to receive updates on future podcasts, check us out on social media or at levelupstronger.com. And remember, each time we take risk, educate ourselves, and apply what we've learned to our lives, we level up stronger. Each time we level up stronger, we have the opportunity to reach back and contribute to someone else's success too. 